Chapter 21, The Role of Expectations in Macroeconomy. So the Federal Reserve has a model. It has a model that takes in data from the past, and it also has data that it takes in from the current macroeconomic indicators, the monetary indicators, and then they factor all of that, and then they have expectations of what the one year, two year inflation is going to look like, what the employment, unemployment rate is going to be looking like. So these expectations that the Federal Reserve has, the same expectation the general public, you and I would have, the businesses would have in terms of like, what would be the inflation? Would it be cheaper to borrow money from the Federal Reserve? Would the interest rate be low? So these expectations that you and I as public have, the businesses have, from the central bank, expectations from the central bank play a big role in terms of how the economy works and the role of the central bank in setting the right expectation is very crucial. So prior to the theory of rational expectations, there was this adaptive expectations. Adaptive expectations basically saying the Federal Reserve, when, when they make decisions in terms of what interest rate to set, um, what employment uh, rate they are going to target, or what inflation rate they're going to target, they just looked at the past data. And then as the past data got worse or got better, they, they used to adapt. So that's why it's called adaptive expectation. But that had a big flaw. It didn't look at the current you know, indicators or the expectation that people have, the consumer expectations. And so there was a new theory of rational expectations, which basically says, look at all the data, not just the past data. Look at the past data, but look at the current data, but also look at the future expectations that the people have built, right? Uh, because the monetary policy, the government fiscal policy, all of that should be looked into to build a rational expectation model, which is basically saying, give me the latest and the greatest optimal forecast, right? So this model that looks into all of these aspects of what is the past data, inflation rate looks like, what's the current data, what's the future expected changes, how is the government fiscal policy doing in terms of budget, deficit, what's the monetary policy uh, central bank doing in terms of interest rate, when you look at all of these things can combine, you get to theory of rational expectations. So this, mo this theory gives out a model that is most accurate in terms of predicting the future. But will it always be right in predicting the future accurately? No, but it will be much better than just looking at the past data that the adaptive expectations model did, right? So one key thing to learn is that when government changes certain policies, or when the central bank changes certain policies, that those policy changes changes the expectations of the consumers and of the businesses. If those policy changes are in the positive direction, meaning those variables, like let's say the, the, the political party in power, they constantly reduce taxes, right? And suddenly they stop reducing taxes, right? So then that is a change in a variable, which is a variable of reducing taxes. And so when such a change happens, when such a new information happens, the future expectations of the people change. They all of a sudden no longer will have the disposable income to spend. And so their future expectations of the public of the industry will change. And when that changes, the model changes. So that was what the Lucas uh, critic was, which basically says, hey, if you just look at the data, uh, with the current and the past, even with the rational expectations model. But if you don't look at the structural changes of how the public is feeling, how the public is incorporating the changes, how the variables are changing, how the public response is changing, then there's a problem. So you're missing out. But if we combine all of this, then we get a model that is powerful, right? It can at best predict the future much more accurately, not 100%, but much more accurately. So this is what uh, is, is the core if we get the right model, then the Federal Reserve can set the right expectations of inflation, of, uh, of unemployment target and other pieces, right? So isn't this all simple? Like you just have all the data, you have the right model, just set and move forward, right? 
but there's this problem called time inconsistency problem with 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 this and I'll explain you this time inconsistency problem with an example that's in the textbook is very good which is let's say as parents when our kids uh, they demand something from us that you know it's not good for them so we typically say no most of the time but in public they you know they the kid might throw a tantrum and you want to just you know quieten them so you just give in to their expectation right and so your actions were not time consistent meaning you should have just said no all the time right but you at some point you give in so the kid understands that hey i can just throw tantrums and get out anything that i want from my parents right so similarly, the Federal Reserve, they know that there's this great model that's telling us, telling them to do the right thing, focus on the long term. But then they also face this time inconsistency problem where the long run objectives are not really prioritized because there are some short term gains. You know, so, so when that happens, because for many reasons, one of the reasons is political influence. Um, when there is a re-election, re that there's generally a year before there's expansionary policies uh, that, that are influenced uh, by the political party so that there's more employment and then there's you know there's um, they, they probably get re-elected again right so that time inconsistency problem can be solved by either having rules that says hey we are gonna you know have this percentage inflation target and we're just gonna keep going right there's rules and we, we automatically change based on the model no discretion allowed, right? So then this that's too rigid. You stick to the plan, but then it's too rigid. Rigid because, you know, there could be events that the model currently doesn't incorporate. There are things that are changing that the human judgment can catch. And so discretionary uh, policy changes allows for ju judgment, but also allows for some events that are not like factored into your model. So like the black swan events like COVID-19, right? Um, so, or the world war, right? So all of those things um, make it harder to just go with either the rules or the discretion because the discretion can be influenced by political uh, parties. So what you could do, the best alternative is a combination, which is a constrained discretion. By constrained discretion, what, what the Federal Reserve can do is saying, hey, I'm gonna pick a credible anchor and say, hey, I'm gonna go for 2% inflation target. And that's my stated dual mandate goal as a Federal Reserve, my dual mandate goal, number one is inflation, low inflation, and number two is uh, maximum uh, sustainable employment. And so when I do that and I give a number to myself as the Federal Reserve Committee, I say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna constrain myself to focus on getting to 2% inflation rate. And so then I'm, 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 but I'm also gonna keep all my flexibilities open and how I do it and when I do it, right, as Federal Reserve. So then, you can actually stick to the long-term plan. So picking a credible anchor, right, it, it could really help with uh, solving this time inconsistency problem. When you, you, you focus on the long-term because you, you stated your objectives. And so how, which anchor to choose then, right? The anchor you could choose is, hey, I'm gonna focus on inflation. Or you could say, hey, I'm gonna constantly increase certain percentage money supply. Or you could say, I'm gonna, make sure my exchange rate is stable because I'm gonna now peg to a, a very stable currency like dollar or something like that. Or I'm gonna target to a real GDP. Say, hey, I'm gonna target for this percent of GDP so I'll not slow down. I'll also focus on when, when the GDP is slowing down. So there's so many ways in which you can pick a stable anchor, but there are pluses and minus to each of these points. So for example, money supply, right? Uh, you can't really constantly increase money supply when there is no need that could cause higher inflation as well. Exchange rate pegging, now you're dependent on the, the parent uh, country to make sure that they are stable, right? So then that has issues. GDP targeting, again, now it's very difficult to explain, like, hey, you also um, target um, inflation, you'd also target um, employment so that output is high, but inflation rate targeting is the simplest. And that's why a lot of countries adopt that. So inflation rate targeting is something like saying, hey, I'm gonna go and target to, to getting to 2% inflation. So when you do that, right, how you do inflation rate targeting, India, I believe uh, with Raghuram Rajan, Rajan recently also did uh, successfully achieve uh, inflation rate targeting. So the way you do that is there are these five steps. Five steps are, first is you, you make a public announcement saying, hey, this is serious inflation, we're gonna get, bring it under control. 
right? And so you publish out numbers that says, hey, these are our numbers, these, these are the inflation numbers, and we'll get to this by one month, three months, six months, 12 month goals. And then you have a commitment, institutional commitment that says, hey, I'm gonna stick to this and we're gonna just focus on inflation. And then you do that with your actions by, by controlling interest rate, uh, by monetary tightening or monetary easing, depending on where you are. And then you have multiple factors that you look at, not just the macro, um, few, few of the money supply indicators, but you look at all of the macro indicators to find out like, hey, is, is our inflation targeting working? Then you increase transparency. You go to the public events as federal uh, central bank and you say, hey, we're gonna do this. This is, this is our goal. This is how we're gonna do it. And then you increase your accountability saying, hey, are we achieving the goals? So you, once you set inflation targeting and you do what it takes, you can actually get inflation under control. And once you got your inflation under control, you can actually then stabilize output and keep inflation low for the long period of time. And many successful countries, big countries and small countries have done this. And so that is huge. And so you might understand like, hey, why, why, is, why is this inflation targeting and why is this you know, uh, setting expectation important? So let's take a simple example. We know our aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So if, if our aggregate demand and aggregate supply was here, but and then we got a positive demand shock. Let's say there's a huge uh, outlook increase, the consumer expectation goes up saying, hey, uh, so there's a demand shock, a positive demand shock. So what happens is uh, your uh, output goes from one to two, right? And your inflation goes up. And so if there is a central bank that has no credibility, even your aggregate supply goes up. So then what happens, you have a permanent increase in inflation potentially, and you might have a slight increase or slight decrease in output based on like how your aggregate demand and supply curves moves, but it's certain that your inflation will go up permanently. If you have a not credible central bank, which doesn't have anything like, hey, we're not gonna focus on inflation target. But if you had a credible central bank which has inflation targeting, then what would happen is the aggregate demand shock will move from one to two, but it'll soon go back from two to one. So there'll be a temporary increase in inflation, but the inflation come back, the aggregate supply will never go up, right? Similarly, if there's a um, negative demand shock, like let's say oil prices go up. So then your aggregate supply just goes up to the left, right? And so inflation goes up, output reduces, but if there's a not credible central bank, then, then that just continues to go up. Meaning instead of coming, coming back, like what it, it would do in a credible central bank situation, it would keep rising. Inflation would keep rising and stabilize at a point. It would have permanently damaged your long uh, your LRAS, right? Long range aggregate supply, right? So, uh, so that will permanently go down, the output will permanently go down. So that is huge. Your economy is permanently damaged because your central bank didn't set right expectations. But if it did, then the, the, the consumers, the industries would realize that, hey, the central bank's behind this. So they, they'll automatically come back. And this has happened several times in the oil crisis, 1970s, 1979s, and 2007. Right, uh, in 2007, there was no change in inflation in the United States, but in 1970s, 1979, a huge 10% plus raise in inflation. So, and that happened because the Federal Reserve gained, gained credibility. It gained credibility since 2000, and uh, especially under uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, who, who really got inflation under control through inflation targeting. So, very, very important, you need to have uh, credibility Right, as a central bank to set right expectations. Uh, if, you, if you set the right anchor and if you, if you have the commitment and if you, if you go through it, there will be pain because you know this, when, you, when you control inflation, there may be times when you would have to do monetary tightening to bring down inflation. And so there may be people who might not be able to borrow money because it's, it's more expensive to borrow. Um, so, so that's that. Also, like who's in charge? Like, are you are you having credible bankers at the central bank who understand macroeconomics, who understand that inflation is important, who understand why it's important, and who are conservative, meaning they're sensitive to inflation, and that also helps. And and then having more and more of the central bank be independent also helps because otherwise the political short-term wins uh, could cause time inconsistency problem. I think the textbook did a pretty good job in explaining this point, which says, hey, you can't have a fully independent central bank because 
it, the democracy works with the expectation of the people. So if you have some few elite people running the central bank, making decisions that have a huge impact on the economy without the input from, from the democratic uh, process of the people who are running the country, then that's a big disconnect as well. So while you need more independence, you cannot be fully independent central bank. It has to be uh, that the political party who understands the pulse of the nation would, would have a huge input to play, but more and more independence certainly helps. Uh, but, but I think the balance of power needs to be there in such a way that uh, the country is not permanently damaged, but at the same time, the goals are being hit. So very, very important chapter if the central bank can build credibility if the inflation is brought under control then we've studied in the last 20 chapters how people's expectations around like investments goes up right they they feel that the prices are not just suddenly changing my interest rate uh, is, is is stable my uh, unemployment numbers are are looking stable my exchange rate is stable so when, when that happens the confidence suddenly goes up right so credibility in the central bank huge importance in setting right expectations so that when the public uh, sets right expectations and, and then they'll act independent of what policies the Federal Reserve runs if the public doesn't have credibility uh, in the expectations that the central bank is stating then none of these outcomes will actually happen because the public has lost faith they will they will do what's best for them at that point and they'll not be able to make long-run investments uh, that are really important to stabilize uh, and increase output, but also stabilize unemployment and have uh, um, a stable inflation. All right, that is chapter 21, role of expectations in macroeconomy. Thanks.